The scripture reading this morning will be from Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And let all the people say, Amen. Amen. Are you glad to be here today? Woo! Wow! It is good to see all. If you're visiting today, welcome to the Mesa Church of Christ. We're excited you're here. We have one awesome preacher. He is in the Word. He knows what he's doing. He's been a great help to this congregation, and I'm not him. Terry Singleton is our minister, and he's in Angel Fire, New Mexico this morning. Angel Fire, that, well, he comes back, that ought to be a quite a change, shouldn't it? Wow. So we're not talking this morning about normal things, we're talking today about missions. Mission Sunday and what the Mesa Church does to take the gospel to the whole world. And it's kind of exciting thinking about that, and so... Uh, just another 197 days in paradise. You hear the word paradise and what comes to mind? Well, I checked with Webster, Daniel, and he said that paradise is either a location or a state of bliss or happiness or delight. So that's what we think of as Americans when we hear the word paradise. Okay. So 197 days in paradise. So whatever comes to your mind when you think of paradise, uh, maybe, is this paradise? Those are my grandkids. Yeah. Where are they? They're in southern Thailand on the beach outside of Kirby. And if you read the travel brochure about southern Thailand and the beaches and the tropical beaches and the palm trees and the coconuts, and the beaches are so beautiful, they call it paradise. A location or a state of what? Bliss, happiness, or delight. And so is this paradise in Southeast Asia? Well, that's what the travel agents would have you believe. But I think reality may be more like this. What's for supper tonight? Am I turning your stomach? That is a whole truckload of dogs. They've been rounded up in northeastern Thailand, and they're being shipped to where? Vietnam for supper. Fifi's going to be steak tonight. Paradise. A what? A state of mind or a location of what? Bliss, happiness, or delight? Well, that's not our idea of paradise, is it? How about this one? Oh, that's right outside of the, uh, where the ship of life was. That's the air-conditioned bus that would take you to the villages. Real air conditioning. What do you call that? Paradise. Is this your idea of paradise? The one on the uh, left in Thailand, 65 million people. The travel brochures give you the beautiful pictures of the beaches of the big temples. But a lot of folks live like this in shacks. 50 million in Burma the same way. On the right, those are houses in Cambodia that we took a picture of. I wonder why they're up on stilts. Well, because in the rainy season, guess what? The water comes up 20 feet, and it comes up right underneath their floors. And so that's paradise where? In Cambodia. Or in Laos with another 6.5 million people. Took this picture on the left from the ship, right on the rail, and then just took a picture of what was right there by by the ship. And that was it. And Jean and I got off that evening and walked through the village, half a mile this way, a half mile that way, looking for a Coca-Cola. A Coca-Cola. No electricity, no running water, one motorcycle in the whole village, because it was on an island, and guess how many Cokes? Zilch. No Cokes. And of course, medical care is on the right, The building's there, but guess what? Inside, there's not a whole lot. And so the travel brochure calls this what? Paradise. 
But Jean found paradise. We'd been there about two months, and she'd been washing clothes in a tub on the, on the, on the floor. And I found a laundromat. <laughs> and she lit up. <laughs> wow! And so for the next four months, she got to use a laundromat. And she thought that was what? Paradise. A what? A, a state of mind or a location that's what? Bliss or delight or happiness. Well, the story actually goes back to 1969. That's our founding family when they first went to the mission field ooh, 46 years ago. Let me read you. I actually found this when, we, when mom passed away and we went through her belongings. I found this picture. And this is written on the back of it. October 1st, 1974. Pijit province. That's about six hours north of Bangkok. Going back to Bangkok... Five kilometers by ox cart, that would be about three miles. We walked in the generator and the projector road. Two kilometers by a boat, that's about a mile and a quarter. Six hours by a car or van. One was baptized, over 800 heard the gospel. A congregation of six members, less than one year old. That was paradise 40-some years ago in Thailand. That's what preaching the gospel was in Thailand back before the internet, before paved roads, before... Uh, a lot of the modern conveniences that, that we have now. Last November, there's Fox preaching in a congregation in Thailand. You notice on the wall behind him, they got the same stuff we have. They got PowerPoint. They got a screen. They can sing off the wall like we can. Wow! Paradise has arrived where? In Thailand. This is the congregation... Forty-some years ago, they met in a straw hut with a dirt floor. And now look at that. They've got a building like we have. Inside, there's folks like us. They actually sit on pews like we do. They're not sitting on the floor anymore. they got a microphone. they got a clicker. Woohoo! Paradise. And actually, not physically, but what? Spiritually. Have you ever thought about where you are this morning? Wow, who you're sitting next to. Who's singing together with us? Who we're singing to? And why we're all here this morning and we're not on the golf course? Why we're not, you know, sleeping in? It's because this here is what? Paradise. This is paradise. It's what? It's a location or a state of mind of happiness, bliss, or what was the other one? Delight. Paradise. We found paradise in Thailand because what? Folks there are just like you. They just love the Lord, get excited, and they can jump up and down just like... Well, some of us don't jump up and down too much. Maybe that's not how we display our love for the Lord and our excitement for the Lord. But paradise is what, what we found in, in Thailand and brethren that love the Lord just like you do. In Acts chapter 14, Paul and Silas came back from their first journey. They had been preaching... You know all the accounts. And so in verse 27, they gathered the church together and began to report all the things that God had done with them. And so this morning, I'd like to report to you all the things that God did with Gene and myself uh, for 197 days in Southeast Asia. So there it is, read it, we... 20,000 miles flying, 6,000 miles driving, 6 countries, 15 congregations, 16 sermons, 27 days, 51 days preaching. About it. Is that what you wanted to hear about? No. We don't want the mechanics. We don't want to know that, Fox, you spent $10,265 in, in 197 days. It came out to $62 a day, 41 nights in a hotel, and 1,182 plates of rice. Is, is that enough detail? Okay. So that is probably what Paul and Silas came back and told the church at Antioch. This may be a better idea of what happened in 197 days. You can see where Bangkok and Kongan and uh, Rangoon, Phnom Penh, those are the three capitals of the countries we worked in. Kongan is where we set up shop. The brethren there furnished the car and furnished the, uh, an apartment. So we lived there uh, freely for 197 days. And so what happened in the things, in the brethren that we met? 41 years ago in 1974, a young man finished Oklahoma Christian 
met a young American named Rebecca. And so they got married and they went back to Thailand. He was Thai, American. He went to the Sunset School of Preaching, got some Bible. And he went back to preach the gospel. And that was 41 years ago. And so most folks go and they'll stay here a while and go there a while and go here and then they go home a while. He stayed in one place for 41 years. What happens when a preacher stays in one place for 41 years? What happens when a missionary goes somewhere to some foreign country in some other language and he stays in one place for 41 years? He grows a church. And this is the church that met last October in Kongan, Thailand. 41 years in the same place. They raised their kids there. The kids graduated from high school there. And they stayed and they stayed and they stayed. How do you grow a church that size? Well, the whole northeast part of Thailand has no congregations. And so he, Gim, set up a, a goal of establishing a congregation in every province. And how do you start churches if you don't have preachers? And so he said, well, we've got to train some preachers. And so he started a Bible training school called the Kongan Bible Institute. I've been privileged to teach there two or three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. And they've now graduated 105 men and women over the last 25 years. And they went out to every province in Northeast Thailand. I think there's 16 now that have congregations of churches of Christ because of what Gim and Becky have done in 41 years in the same place. These five people graduated last week from this school. The girl in the middle is the daughter of this couple that started this work 41 years ago. The guy on the left and the two guys on the right are Lao. They're not Thai. And guess what? They graduated last week. Where are they today? Back in Laos. <clears throat> the government won't let you preach. But these guys will be what? Self-supporting evangelists back in the country of Laos. This is the same place that, remember, arrested all of us back in 1998. October 16th, I had the privilege of preaching the graduation ceremony for their graduating class. And the guy on the yellow shirt is named John. Mission Sunday, you folks here supplied his support while he studied in that Bible school. He graduated that night, got his certificate, and he is now the first Laotian preacher supported by his own Laotian congregation in the country of Laos without any American support. And you know who did that? God did it through you. Mission Sunday provided all the support for John, and now they are supporting their own preacher. That is just awesome, awesome progress. Had a family Bible camp in the Northeast. The brethren asked Gene and I to come and attend. There's about 300 plus that were, were there. They, they do this twice a year. And so I told him about you. I told him about our Mission Sunday. I told him about how you folks love the Lord enough that you share the gospel with people in Ghana, Guyana, and all the other G's, and all the H's, and all the E's, and all the W's, and all the Q's, all those countries that we, if you look on the front page of your bulletin today, you see all those countries and all those people that we're involved in in Mission Sunday, taking the gospel in all the world. And so, and one of my failings is I tell people about you, because I think you're special. I think you've got a special niche in the, in the kingdom. At that meeting, I met this guy. His name's Christian. I first met Christian 40-some years ago when he was a kid of 16. He was in the first class when we started a Bible training school, a preacher training school in Bangkok back in the 70s. Christian was in our first class. He was a 16-year-old kid. He's now a granddad. His son is a preacher for this congregation. He started a Bible training school, trained lots of of church workers in Thailand. Isn't it neat to have a Christian that actually is a Christian? Well, I wonder what their grandkids will be named. Christian Junior? Huh. After the camp, they invited Gene and I to attend the Lao Thai prayer camp. Once a year, the Lao brethren that were jailed come across into Thailand because we can't go into, Thailand, uh, go into Laos. So they come over on the Thai side and have a prayer camp. So again, we got the opportunity to visit. So about, a, about half of the people in this picture were in prison in 1998 because they love Jesus like you do. 
That's the difference between their paradise and yours. Paradise. If you look real closely, you'll see Jerry and Meg Canfield in there somewhere. You might remember them. Then in December of last year, Jean and I had the privilege of working on the ship of life. Some of us here remember the ship of life, don't we, girls? Yeah. Jaden and Rochelle Barnes were on there for a month. They thought, was it a good experience? Yes! If you'd let women preach, they'd tell you how great it was to be on there. (laughs) That ship is 109 feet long, weighs 190 tons, has a crew of 10, and spends their full time treating people medically in the name of Jesus. Not the UN, not some other medical group, but in the name of Jesus, we're doing this for you. And they're doing it well. They're doing it on the Telesop River and on the lake. And so in December, we got to work on that ship. I looked out the porthole of our, our room six o'clock in the morning and saw this sight. What in the world? Look at that. I mean, all the way from the right to the left, there are people sitting out there squatting on the ground. What are they doing? They're waiting to be treated on the ship of life by that crew of doctors and and medical helpers. Six o'clock in the morning. I mean, the sun's barely up. They're covered in their, their blankets and they're waiting for us to treat them. They're coming to us. A hundred people a day. Triage were like this. Jean would get them upstairs on the top deck. She'd weigh them, take their blood pressure, uh, check their temperature, fill out their chart, and then send them to the doctors. And so the doctors would take ten at a time on the second deck and treat them in their clinic. Free examination, free medicine, a pharmacist there that, 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 that gives them the proper medication they need. And then we happened to be there for Christmas. I don't know where you all like to spend Christmas. Uh, three years ago, Gene and I spent it in Burma, and I got, Santa brought me kidney stones, and I didn't think that was very nice. <laughs> so this last year, we were on the ship, and we just happened to have a Santa Claus that had been a drama teacher in high school. Can you imagine what kind of a Santa Claus that would be? And the ten Buddhist crew members on the ship just thought it was exciting to to have Santa Claus on ship. And so you know Kevin Carson. He and Catherine are supported by Mission Sunday here. And they're now in Cambodia working with the ship. You know Tim and Cheryl Carlin. They're in Cambodia now getting ready to manage the ship for the next three months. Wow, you just think about some of the things that's going on with what you do through Mission Sunday. This clean water raft is up at Angkor Wat, a very famous temple in Cambodia. Partners in Progress through the, the church through the Partners in Progress started this project a couple years ago. Do you notice the color of that water? Looks pretty appetizing, doesn't it? You want to go swimming? Aboard this raft is the processing equipment to take that nasty, nasty, you, don't, you can't imagine how nasty that water is. They tested it in some of the worst water in the world. And the equipment on board that filters and and chemically treats it so it's very pure and very drinkable. And so they provide clean, pure drinking water for 12,000 people in that village there. And it doesn't cost them anything. Two of our brethren, Cambodian Christians, manage the raft. And guess what you get when you get your free water? You get a a track about Jesus. You get an offer to teach your kids English. You You get an invitation to come back as often as you want and get all the water that you'd like to have. And who's doing all that? Our brethren, in the name of Jesus. Now don't tell the mission committee. They were planning to meet this Tuesday, okay, and I haven't dropped this on them yet, so if you run into anybody on the mission committee, don't tell them this, okay? But this October, not this year, but October a year, we've got three American doctors that are considering coming over to where this water raft is, And Bill McDonald and Kevin says we can bring the ship of life right up to where that water raft is. So we got the water raft that's drawing people. We've got the ship of life that's tripping people. And then we take all the students from the two Bible schools in Cambodia and bring them in. And we have what? We have a seven-day medical evangelistic campaign. Three American doctors, all these Bible students. Wow, free water, free medical care. And you notice the... uh, 
ships here, and look at the houses are up here on stilts. Well, this is because this is the low season. Rainy season, it's already begun. The water will fill up, 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 up. It'll come right up underneath those houses right there. And so we'll be able to bring the ship right up to the water raft and have a what? A great campaign. Don't tell the mission committee, okay? I haven't sold them on the idea yet. Mission Sunday, back in 1998, we got kicked out of Laos, and so we came into Thailand and started the church in Lampang. The first preacher that we had there, a Thai preacher, committed adultery. He was one of the early members, and so that really was a good start. Then the second preacher we had, he got discouraged because his family was a thousand miles south, and so he quit. And so they were left with no preacher. So what do you do when you've got the church and you've got a congregation and no preachers? You just train yourself. And so James, who is the guy in the middle, I'm sorry that picture is so fuzzy. His wife is Nui Na. They have one child. And the church meets in their home and has for a number of years now. There is a church alive and well in Lampang, Thailand, because Mission Sunday cared enough to send the gospel to that city. We left Lampang and went up to Bangkok. There's a training school there at the Rangkumhang University, one of the largest universities in, in the world. They had like a half a million students. And the church there has what we used to call a Bible chair. But they, have, they evolved into a, actually a leadership training school. And so they train church leaders for the whole country. And while they're there, they also study at the university. So they asked me to teach the book of James there for two weeks. I did, enjoyed it thoroughly. And a great, great group of brethren. We left Thailand and went to Myanmar, Yangon, the capital city. And this picture on February 22nd is the congregation that meets in Sheila and Winsome's house. Remember in Romans chapter 16 and, and verse 5 that Paul talked about Prisca and Aquila and greet the church that meets in their house. Well, this is the church that meets in their house. Back in 1978, I was there for a week. The church started in, in Rangoon, Yangon, by missionaries who could come into the country a week at a time. That's all the government would allow missionaries to come in. So you, you had a church that was started by missionaries coming a week at a time. So 1978 was my week. And so I was there with Garth Vertanis. And this is his wife, Sheila. And this is his daughter, Winsome. Garth has since passed away. And so for 50 years, the church has met in their home. Now, I know that Ashby and John, you all had a church in your house for, what, 15 years? 14 years. I'd like to try 50. Wow. How about if all of us go home and start a church in our home and do it for the next 50 years? What would happen to the churches in the valley? Wow. So this is what God has done through Sheila and Winston Vertanis. About 10 years ago, they launched a second congregation. Recently, they've got a third congregation. So the city of Rangoon now has at least three congregations of the church. Down in the southern Myanmar, they call the Delta region. A typhoon hit that number of years ago. And the church, through Partners in Progress, gathered funds and sent money down to buy food and buy supplies and rebuild houses and rebuild ships. And they sent preachers down there. Foreigners can't go down there. The government won't allow any foreigners in the Delta region. So I couldn't go. Bill McDonald couldn't go. Kevin Carson couldn't go. But the brethren could go. And so they took the money and they went down and helped build schools and helped build houses and fed people and got things going. And there are now ten congregations of the church there. But no leadership. So twice a year, they invite all those brethren to come up to the capital city in Yangon and teach in the Bible. So our joy this year in paradise was what? Teaching the book of Judges for six days. If you got 40 folks in this room, it happened to be air-conditioned this time. That was a nice change. Paradise. And so you're teaching the book of Judges in their language. I'm speaking English. They're translating into... into uh, in the Burmese, okay, so you got four hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, it goes six days, how many hours is that? Yeah, boy, I mean, I was out of gas by Saturday afternoon. What a joy to be with folks like that that would spend six days studying full-time in another language about what? God's word to them. And three more were added for paradise. 
He got back into Thailand, went to another Bible camp. They have these twice a year in two different locations. And this time there's at least 400 plus in this camp. And I mean, folks come from all over. They just set aside that week to go, go to the family camp. And again, God added some more to the kingdom. And there's paradise in the future of those folks. I think paradise now and paradise in the future. Then we left that camp. We, we left it and one afternoon, drove all day and got to the next camp. And they had another week camp. And this time they had 500 people. And it was down on the Gulf of Siam, right on the water of the Gulf. We bought that property, the church did, back in the 70s for a few thousand dollars. It's now worth several million. Yeah, and they use it for family camps. They use it for English camps. They use it for nursing camps. They use it for whatever excuse they can think of to get the brethren together. 500 plus in their uh, auditorium. wasn't quite this, this nice, but it was paradise. They let anybody in there, so I, they asked me to kick it off uh, on the opening night. So I borrowed one of Gene's wigs, put on my sunglasses and got my Burmese bag and put on my ship of life hat and talked about what? Growing up spiritually. And of course, I was a hippie and they, they figured that out before too long. Welcome to paradise. Just think about your concept of paradise being what? Not some place that's 95 degrees and 90% humidity and got bugs and flies, but what? Full of people like you that love the Lord, excited about His church, want to see the gospel preached, and are giving, willing to give whatever it takes to do what? To help the church grow and for folks to come into the kingdom. Wow. How's your concept of paradise? What was that? A location or a state of mind about what? Happiness, delight, and bliss. I never thought it could be bliss to be, you know, 95 degrees and 90% humidity with flies buzzing around and dogs under the table. Paradise. They had the world's largest baptistry. Again, another handful were baptized during that camp. We didn't run out of water. The water was a little cool, but nobody complained. And then the last day we were in Thailand on this trip was April 19th. We were at the original church in Thailand in Bangkok at Song Song Si. They gave me the opportunity to preach on John chapter 4, verse 28. Remember the woman at the well? The Samaritan woman? After this confrontation with Jesus, talking about living water, verse 28, she goes, what? She leaves her water pot and goes back to her village and tells them what great things Jesus had told her. And so the lesson was what? About water pots. And this is what Thai Christians do for folks that they appreciate. That's not the preacher. That's the preacher's wife. Have we ever given the preacher's wife anything? Nancy, you ever got flowers? Wow. Yes, good. <laughs> you think about that. Okay, these brothers know how to show appreciation to, to spiritual leaders. So in front of the auditorium on Sunday morning, they present us with a bouquet of flowers because of what? Because of your mission Sunday. You made it possible for us to go to their country in their language, teach the gospel, and equip their people. So as we looked at 197 days in my concept of paradise, what's your concept of paradise this morning? A location or a state of delight, bliss, happiness. What are you going to have for lunch today? Is that your idea of paradise? What's going on for the rest of the day? What's on your radar for paradise this afternoon? Remember Luke chapter 16? Jesus has been talking to the Pharisees and trying to get their attention. And in verse 19 of Luke 16, he talks about a rich man and a poor man. And so I've taken a few liberties with the text, and you all forgive me for that. But let me read you Fox's version of Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. There once was an American, and so here it is. Where is that? Is that Costco or is that Walmart? 
Is that Walgreens? And then there's what? There's Cambodia and Laos and Thailand and Myanmar and Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia. 10% of the world's population is in Southeast Asia. And even though the tourist brochures show it to be paradise, the reality is what? They're eating dogs. They're riding around in air-conditioned buses. It ain't near as nice as the tour brochure. And so maybe Luke chapter 16, verse 19, would read like this if Jesus was here this morning. There once was an American. Anybody relate to that? Okay. Expensively dressed in the latest guest jeans, wasting his days at Starbucks and the Superstition Springs Mall. A poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, had been dumped on his doorstep. All he lived for was to get a meal from scraps off the American's table. His best friends were the dogs who came and licked his sores. Then he died, this poor man, and was taken up by the angels to paradise. Paradise. The rich man also died and was buried in Mountain View Cemetery. In hell and in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham in the distance and Lazarus in his lap. He called out, Abraham, mercy, have mercy. Send Lazarus down to Circle K and give me a nice cold Bud Light to cool my tongue. I'm in angry, angry, ang ang agony in this fire. But Abraham said, American, remember that in your lifetime you got the Leyte and the iPhone and Lazarus got zip. It's not like that here. Here he's consoled and you're in torment. Besides, in all these matters, there's a huge gully set between us and you, so that no one can come from us to you even if they wanted to, nor can anyone cross over from you to us. The American said, Send Lazarus to my townhouse where I have five brothers so he can tell them to score and warn them so they won't end up here in this place of torment. Abraham said, They have the Bible to tell them to score. Let them study it. The American said, I know, but they're not studying if someone came back from the dead, they would change their ways. Abraham replied, they won't listen to the Bible. If they won't listen to the Bible, they're not going to be convinced by a zombie. <laughs> Fox's version of Luke 16. Our concept of paradise. And what Jesus talked about being paradise. They wouldn't listen even if a zombie came and told them. Why? Because of the way that they're living. You ever get anything in the mail? Wells Fargo loves Gene and I. We just happened to get a couple new credit cards, and they said they can, you can manage your account without leaving your chair. And then they had the audacity to say, paradise is just a click away. Wow! Paradise, the state or location of what? Happiness and bliss and delight? Is just a click away. And so I got out their instructions. Paradise is just a click away. Single spaced. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. On the other side, three more. And then on the inside, oh my goodness. Look at that. Paradise is just a click away. Where is Paradise in your radar this morning? The thief on the cross looked at Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today. Paradise is just a click away? No. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. But that's the only human being in history that heard those words. From Adam and Eve until now, there's only one human being in all of history that God said, today you'll be with me in paradise. For the rest of us, Jesus had to die on that cross, die for our sins. And then, before he ascended into heaven, in Matthew chapter 28 and Mark chapter 16, he told his disciples, told us to go into all the world and make disciples, make apprentice Jesus of all the nations. And that 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, to repeat that, make sure we understood, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So we all want to talk about the thief on the cross because he wasn't baptized. But then when we begin to read Hebrews chapter 9, and look at verse 16 and verse 17, the Hebrew writer says very clearly that if there's a covenant, if there's a testament, if there's a will, it requires the death of the one who made it before it goes into power. And so Jesus on the cross could say what he wanted to do on the thief and say, today you'll be in paradise, and he was. But then Jesus went on to die, be resurrected, and before he ascended into heaven, his will, his testament, his covenant, we call the New Testament, the New Covenant, was in power. And now Jesus says what? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What's your version of paradise this morning? I tried to give you my version of the 197 days in paradise. And again, you might think, hey, that, watch how you say that paradise. They ate dogs. I'm not talking physically. I'm talking about what? A state or location of what? Happiness, bliss, and delight. Can you be happy eating rice for 197 days? Ask Gene. 1,182 plates of rice later. We haven't had rice at our house yet this year. <laughs> Paradise is what? Wells Fargo said it's just a click away. Jesus said what? Paradise is just a... What is that? That's your heartbeat. Paradise or torment is what? Just, just a heartbeat away. Wells Fargo's got it all wrong. It might be true for Visa cards, but it doesn't work in the kingdom of heaven. And so this morning, I hope that you thank God for what Mission Sunday, what the Mesa family has done through the foxes going to Southeast Asia for 197 days. I hope you can see our vision of paradise. And it's not junk, it's not stuff, it's not Starbucks, it's not Superstition Springs Mall. It's what? It's not iPads. It's people like you that are baptized in the name of the Son, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why? For their mission of sins, that they what? That they can be with us in paradise. If in any way, this morning, that we as a congregation, a family of believers can help you either to to become a Christian, or to restore your faith in the Lord, or to get reunited with this body, we'd love to help you right now. If we can help you, won't you please come while we stand?